have the lamb bone. They don't serve lamb, but they have a, a, a lamb bone on the table. There's a, the next scripture there shows a, a, the, the Passover plate was full. The egg's an interesting thing. I still haven't figured out where that came from. They actually roast the egg in the oven until it's so hard you can't eat it. And so it doesn't, it's not anywhere in Scripture, by the way. It's, it's not mentioned anywhere in the Passover meal that Jesus had with his disciples. It was something that came into the Passover meal sometime, they think, during the Babylonian captivity. Uh, of course, the egg's always been a symbol of fertility. And so I'm wondering if it has to do with the Babylonian goddess of fertility, uh, Ishtar. You all have heard of Ishtar eggs, haven't you? I don't know where it comes from, but it is always on the table. Christ said in, uh, or Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 5 and verse 7 that we are to uh, cleanse out the whole, uh, cleanse out the leaven, get it out of our system, and that we are to uh, enjoy the feast with, uh, with Christ who is our Passover in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The Passover meal, uh, of course, is to commemorate uh, the Exodus, the story from Exodus chapter 12. It began with preparation. I'm about three slides ahead of you. Uh, it began with preparation, and the preparation was that you clean out all of the leaven out of the house. You don't have any leavened bread in your house at all. And, and the, the, the parents with small children play a little game. Mom will hide cookie crumbs around the house and they give each one of the children a spoon and a feather and they, uh, they run around the house trying to find the leaven. They, they want to get all the leaven out of the house in preparation for the supper uh, and uh, as Paul said you need to clean the leaven out of your life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5 uh, Leaven is symbolized to sinful behavior. That, that when you partake of Christ, who is our Passover, that we are to get the leaven out of, our, out of our lives, that we are to prepare ourselves for that. He told his disciples uh, to go and, and find uh, the donkey, the colt of a donkey for him to ride, uh, to go into the city, as we discussed this morning. And then he told them, go and prepare Go and prepare the, the Last Supper, the upper room. Go and prepare the room. Well, that was all part of that. It, it was you, you clean the leaven out of the house, you get the table set, you, you get everything prepared uh, to partake of the meal. It was during that Passover meal then that Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. Every Shabbat, every Sabbath meal, every uh, Passover uh, Every Jewish festival began with the lighting of candles. Uh, interesting, traditional Jewish Shabbat candles all have three wicks. They, they, they braid the wicks and put in the wax. Their, uh, their traditional candles have wicks of three. Uh, they, uh, it was always a woman, by the way, who lit the candles, which is fitting. It was a woman who brought us the light of the world. Uh, they said a blessing over the candles and they lit them. They did not have these lighters in the days of Jesus. That's a modern innovation. And they prayed a blessing on the table. I, I don't know if you have seen uh, the fiddler on the roof, uh, but I love that prayer of blessing where mom and dad are praying over their children on Shabbat. May God bless you and give you long lives. May He give you husbands who will care for you. May you be good mothers and wives. And may God protect you from the stranger's way. Uh, ju just a beautiful scene of father and mother praying over their four daughters, five daughters. Uh, if you, uh, you know, can look that up, it's worth, the movie's worth seeing for that scene, if for nothing else. Uh, they, they lit the candles, and uh, they dedicated then... Uh, the, the feast. And they would pray a prayer like this on the lighting of the candles. Baruch atah Adonai Eliano Melech Ha'alom Aher Kitsano Bedvaro Ushvizmo 
Aknu Madilin Hanerut Shel Yom Tov, which means, Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has set apart his word, and who, in whose name we light the festival lights. Yom Tov means this day. This day. Yom, the word Yom is the Hebrew word for day. Uh, may God bless uh, the separation of his word, that he made it holy, and the lighting of the candles bringing us the light of the world on this day. I forgot to put my prayer shawl up when I prayed. As you know, Jewish men cover their heads when they pray. And they do it as a sign of respect. They feel like God is so holy, and we are not, that there needs to be some separation between us and God when we pray. We know that through Christ, we're covered in the blood of Jesus. We're made holy in the blood of Jesus. And through the blood of Christ, we have access to the throne room of God. Hebrews 4 says we, we may approach the throne of God with boldness. There's no separation. He's our Father. He's, he's, not just, he's not just our Father who art in heaven. He is my Adonai. We have relationship with Him. Uh, and we are able to approach the throne of God with boldness. There's no separation any longer because of Christ. And so they light the candles, uh, and they, uh, they begin the meal. Uh, they begin the meal with a, a, a prayer of dedication. There were always four glasses of wine at the Passover meal. Uh, the first is a cup of sanctification. In other words, they make the meal holy. By uh, having a glass of wine, they drink a toast, and they pray uh, this prayer. This information, by the way, comes out of a book called the Haggadah. And the Haggadah is where the rabbis wrote down the things that they had been traditionally doing for about a hundred years. The Haggadah was actually written in about 170 A.D. Uh, but they wrote down the things that they had been doing for the Passover. It's an order of service for the Passover, the Haggadah. Uh, things that they had been doing for 500 years uh, since they came back from uh, the captivity. The prayer of sanctification goes like this. Baruch atah Adonai Eliyanu Melech Ha'alom Borei Prihagafin. That's the Hebrew word for wine, Hagafin. Uh, Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. Uh, now Jesus is going to change the script just a little bit, by the way. As we get into the supper, they bless the wine, drank a toast to sanctify the meal. And they began then uh, the meal. They, they, they ate dinner together. The Lord's Supper was instituted in the middle of a family meal. Uh, they had... Uh, things that they used for a lesson, but it was a meal. They would have had chicken and you know, potatoes and green beans and, and all, all kinds of things, unleavened bread. Uh, they, they could eat. Uh, and in the midst of the meal then, there were several things that they did to help them remember. Uh, they, they, uh, now, of course, in the Old Testament, they were told to eat the meal with their sandals on, with their walking stick in their hand, and they were to eat it standing up. Well, that changed through the years, you know. And so now they eat the meal sitting down, reclining on cushions. Uh, but we'll get into that part. They ate the meal. They blessed the meal. During the meal, usually the youngest boy would sit on the lap of the, of the teacher or the oldest man, whoever was presenting the Passover, uh, a rabbi, or the grandfather, uh, usually it was the grandfather in the family and the youngest grandchild, or, or the oldest, yeah, the youngest grandchild. Which, by the way, in Scripture, in the Gospel of John, it talks about John was reclining on Jesus' breast, the disciple whom he loved. Jesus was presenting the Passover, and John was the youngest of the disciples. And so he would have been the one who asks the four questions at the proper time. During the meal, uh, the father would, would tell the story of the Passover. A and the second cup of wine during the meal was the cup of the plagues. And they would talk about all of the plagues that God called on Egypt, the, the water turning to blood. And they would either...
take a sip of wine on each of the ten plagues, or they would pour the wine into a bowl. Uh, a splash of wine, and they, they would talk about, you know, God sent, God turned the water to blood, and God sent the frogs, and God sent the lice, and God sent the moraine on the cattle, and finally uh, the death of the firstborn of all of Egypt, and Pharaoh finally let the people go. And so the purpose of the meal is to remember. Remember, these are all memory tools to help them remember the things that God had done for them. During the meal, they would take bitter herbs and they would dip them in salt water and crush them with their tea, eat them, to remember that God split the Red Sea and let them cross. And that when uh, Moses uh, lowered his arms, at, that, that the Red Sea crashed back in and crushed Pharaoh's army. And so they would eat bitter herbs uh, at the meal uh, to, to remember that. They would eat uh, hot radishes or a horseradish sauce. Now I've actually tasted Jewish horseradish. Uh, it will take the top of your head off. It is so strong and so hot and so bitter. Uh, but they would eat it to remember how terrible it was, the bitterness of being in slavery and the way Pharaoh treated them. And they, they would talk about all of those things that God led them through uh, during, during the, the, the slavery in Egypt. They would have a sweet dish on the table. And the sweet dish, made from apples and raisins and nuts and honey, uh, the sweet dish would symbolize how sweet it was to, to finally get out of slavery and to go into the promised land. And they would take the, the unleavened bread and dip it in the sweet and, and eat it and talk about how great it must have been to cross the Jordan River with Joshua and how marvelous it was to finally have a home and to have fields that they didn't plant and orchards that they didn't plant and how God provided for all their needs. And, and they would, would, would have, in the midst of this family celebration, they would have this great Bible lesson. They had uh, the unleavened bread, uh, the four questions. They, would, they always asked these four questions. The younger, the younger uh, student would sit in the lap of the teacher or, or beside the teacher, uh, and they would ask these questions. Why is this night different from other nights? Tonight we eat only unleavened bread. Why? Why, why? why? why do we eat the unleavened bread on this night? Uh, and of course it was to commemorate. Well, first because God told them to. He said, make your bread unleavened because you're going to be carrying it with you. Uh, unleavened bread lasts an incredibly long time. It doesn't spoil. Uh, it's striped. It's pierced. Hmm. Isaiah 53 says, By His stripes we are healed. He was pierced for our transgressions. So every Jewish family Thursday night is going to have bread like this that reminds us of Jesus. They would take the bread... Uh, and, of course, it has to be blessed. The bread has to be blessed. Uh, there was a prayer for the unleavened bread. Baruch atah Adonai Eliano Melech HaHalom. By the way, if you hadn't figured out, they start all their prayers that way. Blessed is the Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. The Father, the Teacher would take the bread, and they have a ceremonial bread bag that they have that has three sections in it. They put three pieces of unleavened bread, and the father buries it under the table and leaves it until a significant time in the ceremony. Isn't it amazing? Father, Son, and Spirit in the candles, Father, Son, and Spirit in the bread, uh, and, and they have no idea that they're preaching the gospel every time they take Passover. Uh, blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Uh, 
This morning you talked about John 6. I am the bread of life. If you will eat me, take me into you, and let me become a part of you, you'll never be hungry again. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Uh, the word filled in Matthew 5 means that you've eaten so much your stomach's starting to hurt. You are completely satisfied. Uh, blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. I am the bread of life. Towards the end of the meal, they have the third cup, which is called the cup of redemption. And when they're ready for the cup of redemption, the Father pulls the bread from under the table. He resurrects it. And He takes the center piece of bread out of the bread bag. And He breaks it. And they have a piece to remember. And then He takes the cup and He gives a blessing of the cup. I Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King in the universe, who gives us the fruit of the vine. They bless the cup. It's called the cup of redemption. And this is where Jesus goes off script. Uh, the Passover meal, he, he, he breaks from the tradition, and he says, this is the blood of the covenant, which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. All of you drink it. And they took the cup. And traditional, uh, traditional Jews would read that and say, whoa, 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 wait, wait, what? That's not according to the script. He's changed, he's changed figures of speech. Because that phrase, this is the wine of the covenant, is something that was used in marriage proposals. When a young man uh, and his father agree that that's the woman he wants... A lot of arranged marriages. They still do that in India, by the way. I asked my preacher friend in India, did your father arrange your marriage to Shekinah? I said, he said, yes, yes, brother. My father, my father arranged that. And I said, did you have any say in it? And he kind of smiled and said, yes, brother. I told my father, that's the girl I want you to choose. <laughs> and so the marriage was arranged. Often, that, I mean, they have a 7% divorce rate in India, and what's ours? Maybe 40-year-old maybe, maybe parents are better at picking brides than 20-year-old men. I don't know. <laughs> That's something that they're still working on. Uh, but the father would arrange the marriage, and the boy and his father would go to the girl's house, and the girl and her parents would be there, and they would greet them at the door with a glass of wine. And they would make the marriage proposal. And the boy would say, this is the wine of the covenant. I want to covenant with you. I want you to marry me. This is the wine of the covenant. And the girl had choice. She could say no. She could say no. But if she took the wine and drank it, they're engaged. That's the symbol of the covenant between a man and a woman. And it was such a strong seminal, a sig, a symbol that once you're engaged, in order to break that covenant, you have to get a divorce. You remember during the life of Jesus? Uh, when, Jesus when Mary had Jesus, Joseph said, well, you know, I don't want to make a scene. I'm just going to divorce her privately. They weren't married yet. They were engaged. They were betrothed to one another. But in order to break the betrothal, you had to go to the rabbis and present a cause to get a divorce. Once you drink the wine of the covenant, it, it's a deal. It's been struck. And so the, the boy uh, goes to the girl's house and said, this is the wine of the covenant. And if she drinks it, they're engaged. Every Sunday when we take the Lord's Supper... We're saying, yes, Lord, I'll be your bride. Every Sunday, we, we take that supper and God is presenting to us, this is the blood of the covenant. Will you be mine? Will you covenant with me? Will, will you be my bride? 
under my authority and under my protection? Will you do that? And every time we take the fruit of the vine, we say, yes, Lord. I'll, I'll be yours. And why did Jesus say we should take it? Remember. Remember. When, when, you, when you take the bread and you take the fruit of the vine, remember. Remember who you belong to. Remember the covenant. Remember the blood of the covenant that takes away sins. It was shed for the remission of sin. And every Lord's Day we say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, we, we, we covenant with you. And we'll do it, uh, by God's grace, we'll do it every Lord's Day till Jesus comes again. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 says that we, will, we proclaim, by doing this, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. My favorite communion song is Troit's chant. By Christ redeemed and Christ restored, we keep the supper of the word. Uh, the last verse says, uh, And thus that dark betrayal night, with the last advent we unite, with one bright chain of loving right, until he comes. Every Lord's Day, we put another link in the chain, waiting for Jesus to come. Now, when the boy went to the girl's house, and if she said yes and drank the wine, they're engaged. And then he would say, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. That sound familiar? I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. And so the boy and his father go and build a house. They're engaged. There's no wedding till there's a house, till there's some place for them to live together. And so they go and build a house. And when the father says, okay, this is good enough. This is good enough for you to bring your bride here. Uh, then they go, wait a second, didn't Jesus say, no man knows the day or the hour, only my father knows? It's good enough. It's enough. Then the bridegroom goes and they, they, they go and get the wedding party. And they bring the bride and her family and all of her relatives, and they come and have the wedding feast, which lasts sometimes seven days, um, the wedding feast, normally three or four days. Uh, they, they have the wedding feast, and the young man and the young woman are married by the rabbi uh, under a canopy. Uh, and one of the acts that they do in a Jewish wedding today still is they wrap a wine glass in a, gla in a, in a cloth, and the, the groom steps on it. They don't need that glass anymore. The covenant, covenant's been sealed. He no longer needs to go to her and say, will you be in covenant with me? They've made a covenant. And it's not an all again, off again covenant. It's a forever covenant. Uh, now that doesn't mean that she's always going to be loving and he's always going to be kind. Uh, but it means that they're always going to be in covenant as long as they both shall live. Uh, they, they break the wine glass. Why? They don't need it anymore. They're in covenant. And so it was in the midst of this meal uh, where Jesus took some bread, said, this is my body. Take it. Eat it. And as often as you do that, remember me. He took the cup after the cup, supper and said, This is the blood of the covenant. All of you drink it. Mm. And they covenanted with God. It was only going to be a few hours before they didn't act very good. And it's not going to be long before uh, Judas betrays and Peter denies and everyone flees and uh, but that didn't break the covenant either. Every Lord's Day, we remember. We remember the bitterness of sin. We remember passing through the Red Sea 
having a baptism like they had, where our sins are washed away. We remember the sweetness of forgiveness. We remember the body of Jesus and the blood of the covenant. And we'll do it until Jesus comes again. I hope he comes on Sunday, don't you? I, I hope that we break the bread and drink the cup and the heavens open and Jesus said, I'm glad you remembered. And we'll say, we are too. Uh, interesting, there's a fourth cup in the Passover feast that Jesus didn't use. It's called the cup of Elijah. And at the end of the meal, they take the cup of Elijah... Uh, and they, they send the youngest out into the street to look for Elijah because the, the prophecy said that before Messiah can come, Elijah had to come back. And so they send the child out into the street and they, they, they holler out, Elijah! Elijah! And he comes back in and said, no, Elijah. And so they drink a toast to Elijah next year, next year with Elijah next year in Jerusalem. And so they, they toast Elijah. Why didn't Jesus... Why did he leave that out? Elijah had already come. Remember he said of John the Baptist, uh, he's Elijah. He is the forerunner. He is the one that came to announce the Christ. And Jesus didn't... Uh, he didn't need to send out someone to look for Elijah because... He, he, Elijah had already been there. Uh, and so that part of the feast was left out. Families will close. They, they close out uh, the Passover meal by singing songs, uh, happy songs. Uh, they usually sing Psalm 111 through Psalm 118. Uh, happy songs of God's praise and deliverance, spirited songs. They clap, they stamp their feet, the kids dance, uh, and, and they celebrate the Passover. What did the scripture say about Jesus and his disciples? They sang a hymn, and then he went out to the Mount of Olives. They celebrated the redemption of the people of God, and then they went to the Mount of Olives, where Jesus took Peter and James and John apart and said, Would you pray with me? for one hour and he went aside apart from him by himself and being in agony he prayed father if there's if there's any other way let this cup pass not my will but thine mm. Every Lord's Day, certainly every Passover, but every Lord's Day, we remember. That's, that's what this is about. I'm glad we do a better job than most congregations where I worship of taking the Lord's Supper. I'm glad we take our time, pay a little bit of attention, hear some scriptures, hear some words of, of encouragement and focus focus on what we're doing because it's spiritually significant. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, King of the universe, our Lord, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, giver of life eternal to those who will believe to those who will take the covenant cup and will commit themselves to you through Jesus Christ. Father, we remember and we are grateful. In the name